Well, we've been in the uh, epic series, and today we're going to take a, uh, a break as we do a message today on next generation ministry. And today we're going to be talking about impact and, and what that looks like. And you know, as, as I was thinking about today, I began to look back over my own life and think about who is it, who are those people that in some way have impacted me? And of course, as I started and thought back on it, instantly I began with a parent. And then from there, I thought of, of grandparents. And uh, I, I shared a story, and one of the people that had the most profound impact on me was my fourth grade teacher. She uh, kind of spurred me into wanting to learn more, to do well in school. Uh, she was a great encourager. And uh, it was interesting the other week as um, they had orientation. I walked back into my middle school for the first time in 20 plus years as my daughter now is a student at that same middle school. And that flooded me with lots of memories and my daughter and I began to talk about that that, that evening. And so I, she wanted to know what school was like for me and I have, maybe like some of you, I've kept things over the year, boxes, I couldn't tell you what's in them anymore, but I pulled one of those boxes down and we began to rummage through the papers that were there and she asked, what is this folder? And it was from fourth grade and it was, uh, an exercise our teacher would do every week where one student was picked for the week and every student, including the teacher as well, would write an encouragement about something that stood out about you. And that had a huge impact on my life because of things I went through as a child. Then I got to middle school, and let's be honest, middle school are those turbulent years. Some of you have gone to therapy for middle school. You have cast it out. You don't even want to go through it with your kids anymore. Uh, you would happily skip over it. It's a very awkward time, but it's a time that we have to go through in life in many different capacities. Well, during that time, uh, I began to delve into things that were not good. I began to explore to become more independent in my own thinking and my actions. And uh, it was through that time that I began to really move away from what I had been taught as, as a young person, as a kid. And uh, even though there were some aspects I believed, there were other things I didn't necessarily want to believe. I wanted to take out the parts that affected me in the Bible because I wanted to be able to continue to do the things that I enjoyed doing at that time. And so I remember that it was eighth grade and we had a new student pastor come. And instantly, this student pastor saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself. He began to spend a lot of time with me and uh, began to encourage me and spur me on to do more. And that had a huge impact on my life. And in the last few years of high school, I had the opportunity to be mentored by a gentleman in our church. About every other week, we would sit down, we would talk about life, the Bible. Obviously, at that point, plans for the future and how God needed to be part of that. Is, it was about that time that I fully gave my, my heart over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then I got to college. Best years of your life. Whoever said high school was, that person never went to college. All right, College was awesome. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to a great Christian college, grow in my faith, my walk with the Lord. Many professors who spent time outside of class with me. Uh, there was a local pastor who for three years we met weekly, and uh, he mentored me as far as life, uh, ministry, just different things, being a Christian, uh, what it's going to look like one day in my own family. And then I began to think about even the impact of friends. It was 20 years ago this summer that I, I've alluded to a missions trip that I went on in 1995 and forever affected my heart for Jesus. And I met a, a guy on that trip. We were divided into two teams. He went on the other team. I went on this team. Reconnected back at college, became great friends, became roommates, uh, served in each other's uh, weddings as well. And it was pretty cool this past Monday even as uh, we met halfway. He lives in the upper PA and we met halfway and spent the day together and just talking about ministry, life, and uh, just where we're at. And it was amazing to reflect on 20 years and just, you know, how you have those people there for you in life. Here's the thing it comes down to is we've all been impacted by people in some way. Maybe good, maybe bad, but in some way people have impacted your life and in turn, you have impacted other people's lives. You are currently impacting people's lives. And as you think back over your life, who had the greatest impact on you? Now think about that. Who was it that impacted your life in such a way that you were never the same after that? And as we look at this today, we're going to talk about this word impact. And here's what it means, the fancy dictionary version. To influence, affect, 
or a force exerted by a new idea, concept, or ideology. Anytime at the point of impact, you hear people talk about that impact, things happen, things change. When we impact people's lives, lives change. And that's what we want to talk about today as we look at that. And so I want you to think of these two questions. And it goes back to this. Who am I impacting right now? Who is it in your life at this very moment that you're impacting? It's somebody. And then the follow-up question would be, what am I impacting them with? What is it that I am giving to them? How am I making a difference in their life? And here's why I say that. There was research done several years ago where they said this, that the average person in their lifetime will influence 10,000 people. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're looking at the person beside you and you're like, I hope they don't influence 10,000 people. They're nuts. I live with them every day, right? You're thinking that, that's okay. You don't want 10,000 of you running around and that's not what it's talking about. But how does that work? Well, I began to think about my own life and how that is affected. And if I went back to my teenage years when I made that definitive change, when I gave my heart to the Lord, because one person saw something in me and invested time in me and impacted my life, that I now stand here 20 years later having the opportunity to influence people in my high school when I changed. When I went to college, had the opportunity to serve in different capacities and you know, be in front of the student body and, and do that. When I've had the opportunity to be in front of churches, when I've had the opportunity to be in other countries. It's interesting, this past week I started taking uh, Spanish at Hagerstown Community College. There is nothing better than being a 37 year old guy in a class of a bunch of 18 and 19 year olds. They're clueless. Like I'm sitting there thinking like, they're just trying to survive on study. And I'm thinking, man, I'm married. I have two kids, a job, you know, a house to pay for. And they're just like, man, I, I don't know when I'm gonna get time to study Spanish. I'm thinking, you, <laughs> you guys have no concept of this, you know? I'm gonna impact them. I'm like, let me give you a slap of reality. But, but here's why I say that, because no one ever told me 20 years ago, you know what? One day you're gonna have a privilege and an opportunity to go into other countries and tell people about Jesus Christ and teach them. I probably would have laughed them right out the door. There's no way that's gonna happen in my life. And so here I am now, I'm trying to you know, learn Spanish so that when I go to Nicaragua or Costa Rica that I can communicate because I don't wanna communicate through a person. I wanna be able to communicate with them on my own. And so you know, I didn't realize that the impact of what happened 20 plus years ago when someone finally you got a hold of a knucklehead kid in eighth grade and started working with them, how much my life would be changed. And so it's very important to think about the people we're impacting, especially this next generation, because everything's being bombarded, thrown at them, all these different messages, and they're trying to figure it all out. They're trying to, you know, wade through all of the, the muck and the mire and trying to say, you know, what is it that I really believe? And what is it that I know to be true? And how do I apply that to my life? And some of us as adults are even trying to figure that out as well. And so as we get into this, I, I want to say this. There's always those moments where something hits you and you, you just wrestle with it and you can't get it out of your head. And I had one of those moments in July. As I was uh, taking a class uh, for my master's degree, we had to read a book. Now, if you know anything about college or as you work, they make you read. And then when you're done reading, they make you read more. And uh, they always want to condense it in a small amount of time because, you know, I remember the first class I ever took for my master's degree, I thought, you had to do the evaluation. What would you say to the professor? I'm married, I have kids, I work, I serve in my church, and I take your class. Because it was like we had nothing else to do but schoolwork. So anyways, I'm reading this book. And there's a quote, and it hit me. And instantly I highlighted, I underlined, and I began to write thoughts in this book. And this is what this quote said. And I'm going to put it up here for you. We impress people from a distance, but you impact them up close. Now you're probably thinking, duh. You know, he's a knucklehead, right? It hit me. It was that time where it just hit me. We were, it was right before we left to go to Costa Rica as a church, and the whole time I'm there, I'm wrestling with it. I'm, I'm dealing with this, and I'm thinking, you know, what is it? You know, if people are really to look at my life, are they just impressed by what they see? You know, because pastors can get up on a Sunday morning and give a message, and they can impress you with it, 
but I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a person that just impresses people. I don't want to do things in ministry that people just talk about and say, wow, that's really cool or that's really good. I want to impact lives. And then I began to think about that, like, am I really impacting lives? And whose lives have I impacted? And I began to think about, you know, all my former students in my first church and all the students I had when I was at the school and, you know, everyone else coming in contact with them. Like, did I really impact their lives? Or did I just impress them? And then I began to think even in my own, own life, you know, when it comes to my kids, do I just impress my kids? Or do I really impact my kids with something, from the future, for something for their future? Do I make a difference? And I'll never forget, I had a conversation, it was first grade, my daughter came home from school, and I asked the million dollar question that we all ask when your kids come home from school. How was your day, right? And what do they say? Good. Why was it good? I don't know, it just was, you know? Why do you ask me all these questions every day? You know, you, you guys been through it, right? We can all be a support group. But I asked that question, and my little girl, who's not so little anymore, little pigtail, she said, Daddy, I really like my teacher. I said, that's good, honey. I want you to like your teacher. I want you to enjoy your teacher, because if you don't, let's be honest, it makes sure you're miserable. So I said, why? Why is it that you like your teacher? And she said, well, today, she talked to me. I think, that's good. The teacher should talk to you. She goes, no she got down on one knee and talked to me. And so I started to ask my first grader at this point, all these questions, I'm like, well, explain how you felt and why did that mean something to you? And this is what my first grader got. A lot of times it feels like people are just looking at me and pointing a finger. But today she got down on one knee and she looked me in the eye and talked to me. I'm thinking, a six-year-old gets this. And at that moment, as I was thinking back and thinking about today, that teacher didn't leave an impression. She impacted my daughter. And she still talks about it to this day. First grade. So we never realize the influence that we could be having on someone at this very moment that will completely change their course of life or the direction on where they are going. And so I want you, as we think about this day, to think about this quote, because this quote has messed me up spiritually over the last couple months. I have wrestled with this for a good six to eight weeks now. Like, is my ministry built upon oppression or is my ministry and my life built upon impact? Because God, if it's not on impact, then take it all away. Because I don't want to be someone who just impresses people because that doesn't change eternity. It's when I get down in the trenches with people, as we're going to look at today in this passage, it's when I get down with people and I do life, that's where I have the greatest impact and that's what I want to do. And so the big idea we want to come at today and we want to think about is this, is that impact comes from your life. Impact is happening whether you want it to or not, whether you try to stop it, you can't. It's kind of the commercial where you see where the two cars are coming and it stops and the dad gets out and he pleads with the guy, like, please just slow down. Please just, you know, my kids are in the back seat and the guy's like, man, I'm sorry. Because when, when two forces are coming together and impact's going to happen, you're, you can't stop it. And when it happens, things change. Things are completely different. And so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9 today. And if you want to turn there, we're going to be in uh, verses 35 and then go into chapter 10 to verse 6. And we're going to look at this passage because instantly when I thought about this uh, topic, you know, do I impress people more or do I impact them more? This is one of the verses I kept coming back to. I kept thinking about. And a matter of fact, even when we were in Costa Rica and I did the training, I took them through it because as a pastor, when you start having thoughts, you take everybody through your thoughts because that's a way to wrestle through it. And so as we were in Costa Rica, that was the first go is like, you know, let's talk about what this looks like in your culture. How does this look in, you know, in my own culture as well? And so we're going to read through this and then I'm going to give you some thoughts. And this is what it says. Jesus was going through all the cities and the villages and he's in Galilee. All right, let's set the stage. He's in Galilee. If you don't know where that is, go home today and, you know, Google Galilee and Jesus and see it on a map. He was teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And he was healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, here's the key. He felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. 
Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now here's the names of the 12 apostles. We're gonna skip over those for now for time's sake, but go to verse five. So these 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, he's on his journey, he's in Galilee. The whole purpose, the whole reason Jesus did what he did was for this, the advancement of the gospel. Keep that in the back of your mind. That's what everything was about because you're gonna see when he releases the disciples exactly what he's telling them to do. Now, for those who are the <clears throat> OCD side, I know you think we're gonna start in verse 35. We're not gonna do that. We'll come back to it. Go to verse 36, all right? Because first thing we have to look at, what was the reason for impact? Why did impact have to happen? Why did Jesus do it in this moment? Well, in verse 36, as we saw here, it says this. He saw the people. Well, the first thing is he looked. You're never gonna get impact or create impact if you don't look at your surroundings and where you're at. You have to look at it. You have to notice what's going on around you. And as he began to look, it says he felt compassion for the people. There was something inside of him that he felt. And the actual word there that we talk about, this compassion, is this. You ready for this big word? We're, <clears throat> we're going to test you afterwards. Spalak na zo mai. We'll say it together. Ready? Spalak na zo mai. Man, you're good. So you just learned Greek today. All right, <clears throat> here's what that means. You've heard us talk many times about spalachna, that deep inner parts, the bowels of where you're at. Well, that word's related to it. And what it is, it's this compassion that is deep with inside of you that moves you to action. It's inside of you and you can't get rid of it. You have to do something about it. You, you gotta move in a direction in order to help whatever that thing is. And why is it that he did that? Well, he said that he saw the people. They were as though a sheep without a shepherd. Now, if you know anything about sheep, they're used quite often in the Bible as a picture, but sheep are clueless. If you were to take the fence away from the fold and let them wander, they'll just keep wandering. They're not coming back on their own. And if there's a cliff, they're gonna walk off the cliff because that's what sheep do. And, but when they hear the voice of their shepherd, they return, they will follow the voice of their shepherd. The other thing is wolves are a threat to sheep. When they get the sheep, they will hold them down. They will oppress them. In the context here, the people are the sheep. Well, then who's the shepherd? And the shepherd is the religious leaders of the time. Now, the problem is the religious leaders are not growing the people. They're not impacting the people, but they are impressing the people because as we've studied about the Pharisees in that day, they were dressed to the hilt. They were cool before there was ever an Abercrombie or Fitch or anything like that. They looked good. So when people saw a Pharisee walk in, they were thought, hey, you know, this is someone important. This is someone to be reckoned with. They knew the laws. They wrote more laws. And so these guys impressed people all the time. But because they were as those sheep without a shepherd, we find quickly they weren't impacting the people. And so as Jesus sees this, it goes on and says this, as a sheep without a shepherd, he is moved in compassion. Now I'm going to ask you, what does that compassion look like? Because let's visualize this. How many of you have been on a mission trip? How many of you were affected by that mission trip? Why? Because you see things and you experience things that move you in a way that you can't get rid of them. As a matter of fact, I guarantee you that if we were to sit all the people down and just raise their hand and ask them, tell us about that experience. Most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time has nothing to do with an activity, but a person. There was some person that they encountered, something that happened that forever changed them. They felt something inside of them that they wrestled with, they couldn't get rid of. 
And for some people, they, they go back because they want to help those people. And so when some people have this compassion, this deep inner workings that drives us to do something, some people just want to write a check and give money to help them in some way. Some people continue to go back. And then some people even go full-time into missions work because of that experience. And I can think back to times when I've been on missions trips, when I've seen things, experienced things, I can still tell you where I was at, what the site was like, who I was with, what it smelled like, what it sounded like, because it had such a deep impact in my life. It gave me a compassion for those people. And that compassion drove me to do something about it, to help them in some way. Well, that's what he's talking about here. He says, do you have that? I have this compassion. We have to do something. We have to impact these people. And here's why. Because notice what he says here right away about the people. He says that they are distressed and dispirited. The word here, distressed, means uh, the same. They're troubled. It's also the same word that they use to mean to skin something. So what he's trying to say here is, what I've seen as people is this loss, this hopelessness. If I was to peel back everything and look into their lives, they have nothing to live for. They're just like sheep wandering, lost, clueless, hopeless. There is nothing they have. And that bothers me. And he goes on, he says this. They have no hope, no reason for living. They are helpless and dispirited. They are thrown off. They are cast off. No one is caring for them. They're just cast to the side. They're byproducts of this culture and this society. This can't be. And because he sees the way that people are treated, because he knows there is so much more for them, his compassion moves him to do something. And so that's what brings us to the second thing, because when you see the reason for impact, then you have to create something to, in order to change that, to make that impact happen. And we see that in verse 35, and it says this, that Jesus went through all the cities and the villages. And notice, I always love this. He taught in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing all the diseases and every kind of sickness. So the first thing is Jesus went and taught him something. He didn't teach him more law. He didn't try to oppress them more with the law. It says that he went into their synagogues and began to instruct them, proclaim, you know, to be a herald for the gospel message. Imagine someone, it's like walking into a, a city. I saw this one time in Chicago, this guy standing on a big crate on a corner with a megaphone, you know, preaching to people. You know, it's the picture of proclaim means the herald literally just bellow out. Here's what the message is. So Jesus is in the very synagogues where all the worship takes place and he's not teaching the law, he's teaching the gospel message. He's trying to advance the gospel. He knows what will give the people hope. He knows what will make them feel as though they are loved and they are cared for. And it's not more law. It's more of him. And then it goes on and says he was, he was healing them. The word healing there is therapeo, which is the word therapy. So th the picture here is that he didn't just get in and say, here's your Band-Aid. This will take care of everything you have. You know, here's a, here's a medicine that will take care of it. He walked with them. He stayed with them. He did life with them. It wasn't just a quick answer. It was doing life. And it says, as he went along and as he did that, all the sickness, and the word for sickness there, and it's kind of interesting, is an actual word. Malachia, which is a sickness they would have in that time where the body, the muscles would become very weak and feeble and they were unable to move. So you, you picture this, these people are lost, they're, they're clueless, they're hopeless, they're wandering aimlessly through life. They have no direction. They're weak. They're unable to do this on their own. And he gives the picture that he has come in, he has come to bring them something that will offer hope. He will walk with them. He will bring healing to their lives, not just their physical lives, but their spiritual lives as well, and will forever impact them and change the course of where they are going. That is the impact that he created. There's several other examples from scripture that I want to give you. And you can look these up later and study them, but in John chapter four, Jesus goes to the well in Samaria. We've talked about this before. Jesus didn't have to go into Samaria. He took the shortcut. The Jews had a longer way to go around because they didn't want to deal with the Samaritans. They didn't like them. But he went in. 
And not only did he go in, he talked to a woman in public, which was offendable in that culture. And not only did he talk to a woman, he talked to a promiscuous woman. And remember it says when the disciples came back, they were like, ah, what are you doing, Jesus? You can't talk to her. But yet he impacted her in such a way that the moment she left Jesus, what did she do? She went into town and began to tell everyone. Everybody else came out to meet Jesus and it said he stayed there and people followed Jesus. Second example comes from Mark chapter two and Luke chapter uh, five. The calling of Levi or Matthew. Hey, I want you to be one of my disciples. So Matthew's like, man, this guy's pretty cool. And Matthew's like, I know what you do. When you meet someone cool, you bring them to your house. So Matthew brings him to the house along with all of his friends and they're having a big party and they're all, you know, out smoking pork in the backyard. And I don't know what they did back then. No, they couldn't do pork. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry, I know what I do when I have a party. They had vegetables and water. That was kind of funny, right? <laughs> all right. So anyways, they're out there having this great party. Everybody's enjoying it. And what are the impressionable Pharisees doing? Why is he in the house of a sinner eating and dining and going about? Why would he do that? Because he wanted to impact Matthew and his friends. Or think about Luke 19. Jesus walking in the city and all of a sudden, you know, I, I picture this day, I don't know what it was like, but this is always what I picture. He's walking all of a sudden, Hey, little man up there, Zacchaeus, come on down here. For I'm coming to your house today. You know, right? <laughs> and so he goes and he hangs out with Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And he impacts Zacchaeus in such a way that he pays back more than what he owes. And the people still, the impressionables, are like, why are you hanging out with that man? Because he needs it. Or how about John chapter 12? Mary and Martha. You know, Martha's busy making preparations and, you know, Mary, what's she do? She takes expensive oil, breaks it, puts it on Jesus' feet, wipes it with her hair and all this stuff. And what are they like? No, you know what you could get for this? You know what you could do with for this? She didn't care because to her, the greatest value wasn't in getting money. It was expressing it upon Jesus. And so when we think all through the scriptures here in Galilee, but also in the other examples we looked at, when we think about what Jesus did, Here's three things that stuck out to me when he creates impact. Number one, he went to where there was a need. You got to go where there's a need. Where are your needs at? This is the easiest thing you might do today. Just look around. Needs are everywhere. There's a need in every house, every community, every country, every corner of the world to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. You go where there is a need, they're everywhere. The other thing he showed us is this, you do life with the person. You don't just get in and get out. You come in and you, you rub shoulders, you live with them, you, you eat with them, you fellowship with them. Yeah, invite them over to your house. Who cares what people think? They need Jesus. And here's my favorite, and I say this all the time, if we really are called to live lives like Jesus, if we really do what he wants us to do, then the last thing we know from all those examples is this. Jesus never left people the way he found them. He impacted them. And here's the thing you have to realize. The message that we have for those of us who profess to know Jesus Christ, our personal savior, that we're called to take, it's an offending message because we're tainted to sinning people. And maybe even some of us have fought against that message. But here's the one thing I do know, because I was in this situation. When someone goes to that person and sees a need, and when someone's willing to do life with that person and willing to be honest with that person and say, what you're doing is sin, it is wrong, and here's the better life that Jesus has for you, that's more important than anything else. Don't let people stay where they are at. You know what, woman? You're right. Even the guy now you have is not your husband. You've had about five of them. Whoa. She didn't run away. She heard, and then she ran away and told everyone, this guy, you need to come hear him. He's legit. He's a prophet. 
it changed their life because someone was willing to say, look, this is what you need. It's not the water from this well. It's the water that will have you thirst no longer. That's what you need. And so Jesus showed us what it meant to have a life of impact. Your life is the greatest tool for impact that you can ever have. How you live your life. We talk about this all the time, that people are constantly watching your life. You're either pushing people to Christ or pulling them further away by how you live your life, by the things you say, the things you do. And so our lives are the greatest tool. And now as we see on a small scale, Jesus has given us an example of what it means to have impact, to create impact. And now he's going to give a broader scope to the disciples and to us. And so look in verse 37 and 38, and this is what it says. He said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now, the first thing he says is this, the harvest is plentiful. It is large. It is out there. Now, Harvest time in the Middle East, in their culture, happened year-round. There was always something that was being harvested. You know, we're at the time of the year now where there's some fruits coming in, there'll be other things in the next few weeks. We're kind of hitting our, our time here in the States. But there was something always in harvest. In the Old Testament, the harvest always refers to God's coming judgment on people when he will harvest the world. In the New Testament, the harvest deals with the spread of the gospel to people. And what he's saying here is the harvest is plentiful. There are many people out there who need to hear the gospel message. Because remember, his whole reason for impact, why he did what he did, was to advance the gospel. And he says, look, this harvest is huge out here. It's humongous. But there's a problem. The workers doing it are few. Who's a missionary in here? Everybody. Everybody. Now, do some people go full-time and get support? Yeah. But we're all called to do the work. And so it's not one of those things where we're like, well, hey, they're paid to do it. They need to go do that. It's like telling a pastor, you're paid, you pray. You know, it's, no, it's something we're all called to do. We're all called to go out and reach this world. But it says the workers are few. It's a very small, little bit of people who are doing the work. You know, it's just interesting this past week, if you were catching the news at all, or if you read anything, the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention is now scaling back uh, their missionaries and their workers because they've been overspending uh, and underfunding. And so now they're in a huge deficit, and they have a new president who's trying to get things back in line, so they're having to bring people off the field. You know, that means that's going to be less people now that they're sending out to share the gospel message. Story I was sharing with um, the first service, you know, this puts it into perspective just the mindset of some people. We were in Costa Rica this past July, and uh, Dave Glaze and myself were sitting down with the pastor of the church there in Ortega, and we're talking about, you know, his heart. And he said, you know, there's a village nearby where there's not a church right now, and no one's taking the gospel message. In some way, I wanted to get my people into that village and to be able to share the gospel message with these people. And we're like, how can we make that happen? How can we partner with you to do that? 24 hours later, one of the other pastors drove up from the capital, San Jose, and he's sitting down with Dave and I, and he's talking, and, you know, we're asking him about his ministry. And he said, you know, it's interesting is we were part of a missions uh, organization. Uh, They've now pulled out of Costa Rica. Why is that? Well, they feel at this point that Costa Rica is oversaturated with missionaries and that pretty much the gospel has been spread. Not... In 24 hours, we heard there's a village who needs the gospel, and we heard of people who don't even live in a country making a decision that, hey, we're pulling out. And he said, we don't get the teams like we used to get. We're not getting the support we used to get. So you know what? Maybe we'll come up and be part of what you guys are doing here in Ortega. You know, once again, I go back to 20 years ago, if you would have told me that you have the opportunity to stand before these people in another country and proclaim Jesus Christ and and help them do ministry and affect people that I'll never meet, I never would have believed it. But when you're sensitive to the call of Jesus Christ in your life, he'll put you in places to harvest that you never thought you would be. He wants to put you there. You just have to be obedient to go. And this is what he says in verse 38, therefore, and we say, what is therefore? 
You go back to previous. Since the harvest is plentiful, but there's few workers, here's what you need to do. Beseech the Lord. Now, that's a great word, beseech. It means to beg or entreat. And actually, it's used in the context of a prisoner. Or maybe a kid that just got in trouble at home, right? I'll do whatever it takes. Please don't send me to prison. Please let me out. I'm innocent. I promise you, I will be a good kid. I'll be a good person. I'll never do anything bad ever again. It's someone literally begging for their life. Jesus gives us the picture here to the people. He says, I want you to beg in such a way that don't just beg for other people to go out, but for people to be sent out into that harvest to do a great work. I want people to go out, pray that it will. Don't just pray to others get sent out, but you go out as well. And then it tells us here in chapter 10, what does he do? He takes the 10, he summons, or the 10, the 12, he summons the, the 12 together and it says this, he gives them authority. He gives them authority. Now, why is that so important? Because the same word authority here is the same word authority in Matthew 28. And what that word means is this. You have the power to act and permission to go in my name. So think about that. We said this before. When you go out as someone who believes in Jesus Christ to advance the gospel message, you are going in the name above all names, the only name under heaven by which men can be saved, and that name that one day every knee will bow before and tongue will confess is Lord, the name of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm giving you my name. I have shown you on a small scale the ministry that you are to do. Now this harvest that is before you that is so great, I want you to go in and do it. And I'm giving you permission to go in my name to do it. And he says, here's what I want you to do as you go into it. In verse five, after he instructed them, after he taught them, he says, do not go in the way of the Gentiles or any of the city of the Samaritans, but rather go back to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the picture of lost here is this. The word lost means completely and utterly gone like no direction whatsoever. I want you to go to people that have absolutely no direction. That's where I want you to start. I want you to go start with who has the most money. I don't want you to go start with who looks the best. I don't want you to go to start with who's the smartest person. I want you to go find the most lost, hopeless, helpless people, and that's where you start. Because I've shown you that's where I go. Start with those people. And why do you do that? If you were to read the rest of 10, the whole purpose is to advance the gospel message. The whole reason I want you to go is so you can advance the gospel message, that you can take it to the masses. He knows what awaits him. He knows what he is calling them to do and what he wants them to do. And it comes back to this question that we ask, what kind of impact are we having? There's two verses I want to look at and they're going to be on the screen. The first one is 1 Corinthians 9, 22 through 23. And it says this, as Paul was writing, to the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, so that by all means I might save some. Save some. I do all things for what? The sake of the gospel. Am I willing to go wherever? Am I willing to do whatever? And let's be honest, probably a lot of us made that choice as a kid. God, if you just give me this, I'll go anywhere you want me to go only to fall back on that decision because things didn't work our way or we knew that we were just trying to barter with God. You can't barter with God. When he wants to move you, he's moving you. He's trying to move us all the time. Some of us are, honestly, we're dead weight. He wants you to go out and impact the people that you're around. He wants you to do all things. Just have the same cry as Paul. I do all things for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When I look at my own life, if people only talk about what Brian has done, then I've impressed them. I want them to talk about what Christ did in my life and how Christ used me because that's what matters at the end of the day, that people see Jesus Christ and want to know Jesus Christ because I live my life for Christ. And that should be each and every one of our prayers. And then he says this in Romans 10, 13 through 15. Paul once again, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever, not some, Whoever calls on the name, well, how are they going to do that? And he says, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. There are people all around us, even here, who need to hear the truth of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't need my permission He's given his permission. 
go do it. Go tell people about who I am. Go advance my kingdom. Tell people about what it means to have hope. The only hope that they're ever going to have is found in the name of Jesus Christ. Here's the thing. The gospel is not just a term. The gospel is a lifestyle. It's living it out to show people who Jesus Christ is and the hopes that you can impact their life in such a way that it will be forever changed for eternity. And so as we think back about what we talked about today, we said this, is that first of all, your life has impact. You do. I know you may have thought 10,000 people, really? Honestly? Yeah, when you start thinking about people you impact, it snowballs. Here's the thing, there's, there's a reason for impact. And what's our reason for impact? Is there are people without hope. There are people who are lost. Well, how do we create that impact? So we submit ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and we go and do his work. We go and take the gospel to people. And the reason for that is because there is a need for the gospel to be taken because there is a great harvest and there are very few people going out to do anything about it. We've become comfortable you know, we've talked about the fact that we sit and we take in our 22-inch experience on our seats every Sunday, but we don't exercise our faith the rest of the week. And the question I, I want to pose to you in a personal way to apply this to your life today is this. Who is it that God is putting on your heart right at this very moment that he is saying, this is who I want you to impact. This is who I want you to go and give hope to. It may be someone in your house someone in your neighborhood, someone at work, someone you just run around with who's in sports, their, their kids in sports with your kids. But I guarantee each and every one of us, if we would pray and really be sensitive to what God is doing, he will put someone on your heart, a name in your mind. This is who I want you to go for right now. I know because I pray that all the time. And it's usually not the people I would have picked. And that's how I know God's in it. Maybe it's someone in this next generation you know, as we talked about, you know, the next generation reaching them, here's why. Most people accept Christ before the age of 18, which means a lot of our work has to be done in children's student ministry. And if we don't reach them, a lot of times they drift away and we lose them. And yeah, adults come to the Lord, but it's usually a lot less than kids. Because let's be honest, there's things in our lives that we become entrenched in, you know, we have traditions, things we like to do, ways we like to do it, and we come steadfast in those things. It's hard to shake us. Whereas we talked about earlier, when you're a young person, man, you're just trying to figure out life. You're trying to figure out how things operate, how things work, how things go together. You know, if, there's all kinds of things you're trying to figure out. You're still impressionable. I want to show you something and, and talk about it for a second. There's some numbers I'm going to put up here. Now, if you were in the first service, you can't answer this. Is there anyone who can figure out what these numbers mean? We have some very astute people in here. They're like, hmm, I'm studying. I'm thinking. It's a formula. All right, I'm going to make it easy for you. Here we go. Ready? There are 150,000 plus people that live in Washington County, Maryland. So I'm just taking Washington County. I'm not even hitting Franklin and PA. I'm not hitting Berkeley. Just Washington County. 150,000. Of those 150,000, 37,500 are under the age of 18. It's a good portion. Now, you've heard us talk about as a church, as several churches have gotten together, Convoy of Hope, that there are about 100,000 people in Washington County who do not attend church any given Sunday. Figures out to be about 67% of 150,000, if my math is correct. If I was to stay consistent and take 67% of the young people from 37,500, that would bring me to 25,125 young people who never step foot in a church in Washington County any given Sunday. So that tells me that there is a great need to reach this next generation. Because if the next generation is not met, that number becomes larger. And I'm not here to say today that you know, next generations, all ages are important. But I know what it means to work with students and with kids. I know what we are trying to do, what we are trying to teach them. Back in the spring as I was praying through this, you know, it hit me. You know, all, how do we reach the students? How do we get more students to come? How do we do this? And I was talking to our student staff, and we were sitting in my living room at a, a meeting one Friday night, and I said, here's, here's what I want to challenge us with in the next two years. 
And we were just at our staff retreat last week with our student leaders, and I said this as well. I want to reach 200 young people in the next two years who do not currently come here. Now, 200 seems like a lot when you're sitting here, but when you're talking about 25,000, it's barely a dent. But how do we reach 200 people right now who are not going to church who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? Over the summer, we've actually grown in our student ministry. We have gained people. We have students inviting their friends, which they should do. And one of the things that excites me the most about doing ministry with the next generation is this. We give them a card to fill out, their name, address, some information, you know, social security number, all that. No, we don't do that. But fill out all their information. And the last thing it says is, I want to grow in my relationship with Jesus Christ, or I want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we get a student who says, I want to know Jesus Christ, that's awesome. It's great when a kid wants to grow, a young person wants to grow, but when we're getting people in our student ministry who do not know Jesus Christ, that's what we want to do. We want to be reaching people who don't know Jesus, not people from other churches or other youth groups, people that know Jesus. And anyone that God brings, we're going we're gonna to work with as a young person. But 25,000, but here's the thing, we can't reach 25,000. They're not all going to come to Switchback Student Ministries. But here's where it starts, because I don't want to overwhelm you with numbers. One. Who's the one person that God is writing it on your heart and in your mind that you need to reach? And you write that name down, you pray for it, you pour over that name, and you find every way possible to tell them about Jesus Christ. And you know, and I, I encourage you to do this as you walk out today. There's some tables set up. There's some great things happening in our, our next generation ministries from you know, preschool all the way up to students. We have Faith Kids Worship, Awana, the, camp, uh, the campus tracks that do meet during this time. There's some great lessons. I mean, I've walked down the hall different times and peeked in rooms and watched creative things that teachers are doing to get a message through to our, our next generation. And you know, after being here for five years and seeing students graduate of our student ministry and some of them now have gone on to to do ministry at their universities, to get involved in parachurch ministries in their communities where they're at. That's exciting to see. And it starts because people were faithful when they were young and they taught them the scriptures and they kept pouring into them. And we have over 150 people that do next generation ministry here at our church. And here's the great news, we're gonna need more because if we're gonna go after those people, those kids, that next generation, we need people who have See, this is a great opportunity to influence the next generation. And if you're called to do that, man, stop out today, look at it. There's an opportunity form in your bulletin today. There's forms on the tables. Talk to one of the, the Faith Kids workers that are out there or someone else that works in the Faith Kids ministry or even the Switchback Student Ministry. Is We need people. And we don't just need people, but we have a huge field that we want to go reach, and we need people to help us do it. And so I hope today, as, as you walk out of here, you think about that. And I'm going to ask you to stand and, and pray at this time as we close. And if God is working in your heart on that, pray about it. See one of us, talk to one of us about it. But no matter where you're at, you don't even have to do next generation ministry because all of us, as we admit it to, are called to do ministry wherever we are at any given time. And Jesus gave us a great example. There's a need. We live in a hopeless society and culture today. We can all agree on that. There are people that if we were to, to pull them back and look, they, there's just nothing there. They're lost. But we have an opportunity to go and impact them with the message and the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you once again for this opportunity to be here to worship your name today. We thank you for the example that you've given us in the scriptures of what it means to really impact people's lives and not just go in and, and give a good show or anything of that nature, because if that's what we've become about, then you should strip us completely of everything. Because there's nothing inside of any person here or any group of people together that's, that's better than you. And so I would ask that we would fully give our hearts to you, that we would ask to be used by you in such a way to influence uh, every person uh, around us, including this next generation. As there's many kids who are be given different messages every day, and some that are obviously very misleading and that will uh, bring them a life of hopelessness. But we know that the greatest hope lies in you, and so we would ask that kids would give their lives to you, that whatever they would do in life down the road would always involve you being part of it. 
And that if we have future lawyers here, future doctors, maybe even future uh, politicians, teachers, maybe even a kid one day just says, man, I just want to stand on a garbage truck, but I'm going to praise Jesus doing it. I pray that the things that they're learning now will affect their hearts, that wherever they go and whatever they do, the most important thing to them would be living as a messenger of Jesus Christ and advancing the gospel wherever they go. And may they see the same in our lives. May we set that example before them to pursue after in our homes and in our church. Be before us now in our day. Pray us all in your name. Amen.